So, uh, so we're talking about quantum physics. Um, you may have heard of this, and it sounds very intimidating, but uh, quantum just means that things are not continuous anymore. They come in discrete steps, like rungs on a ladder. You can't just have any old value. Uh, the first time we talked about something quantized was actually the very first day of the semester. We talked about electric charge, this idea that you can't have any electric charge you want because you're going to have to get your electric charge out of some combinations of electrons and protons. So that means that you can't have any value you want. What we're now going to do is kind of extend that idea because it turns out on a very small scale, lots of things are like that, not just electrical charge. Things that, that you might have previously thought of, well, yeah, you can have any value you want. It's things like energy. So we're used to energy being able to be whatever you want it to be, but it turns out that many things start to be only in steps when you go to a really small scale. And the first of which, what I want to talk about is light. Uh, so, so light, we've been of course talking about light as a wave. So it goes like that. And one of the properties of a wave is it essentially has no beginning and no end, right? It's just kind of like however long you want it, it's a continuous phenomenon. It's kind of everywhere on there all at once. It's not in one particular spot versus another. It kind of stretches out. Um, but we can also talk about light as a particle. And when we talk about light as a particle, those particles are called photons. So here's what you find, is that if you really go down to the very small scale, light is not something that's continuously surging at you, okay? It's actually more like a sandblaster in that these little particles that are very, very small, very numerous, and so uh, you don't tend to notice it, but one of the ways you could, and no, no one really knows how to draw this, by the way, but here's my attempt. What you really have is kind of these wave packets. You have many of them, and so you can't really tell that they are uh, kind of individual packets because they're so small, there's so many. Um, sometimes you'll see it drawn like this, which I don't know what that even means. It kind of shows it like a, as a particle, but with like a little wave. It doesn't literally mean that it's kind of staggering around. Okay, that's not what it means. It just means no one really knows how to draw what we're talking about here. It's like a little wavelet. It's like a little, uh, it's le like a wave, but it's also kind of localized. Okay. So, uh, wave and particle, these are two things that we have commonly thought of as mutually exclusive. So a wave is something that is kind of can be in more than one place at once, whereas a particle is in one place. So we're going to find that what we previously thought of as two mutually exclusive bins is really a continuum. So something can be more particle-like, so it's more localized to a particular location, or it can be more wave-like, so spread out and taking up more than one location at once. But there is a uh, degree of how much you are like one versus the how much you are like the other. So this is what we say is localized. A particle is in this one spot, but it's not somewhere else. And a wave is more fuzzy. It can be spread out or non-localized. Okay? So, um, the very next thing that I want to do is talk about the energy carried in light and talk about that energy in both pictures. Um, the quantity we, of course, use to describe this uh, um, is intensity. Um, we mentioned this, of course, when we're doing, um, you guys just finished your polarization homework, right? where we talk about the intensity of the light and as it goes through polarizers, it can get reduced and stuff like that, right? So let me remind you what intensity is. Intensity is 
uh, its units are watts per square meter. And a watt is just a unit of power, that's energy per time. So a watt is a joule per second. So it's basically joules per second per square meter. So if you want to think about what the intensity is telling you, it's really telling you how much energy is carried by the wave per second onto a given area, onto a given square meter. Okay? That's what intensity is. It's, if you want to, instead of writing it with the units, we can write it with the quantity power per time per area. Oh no, sorry, energy per time per area. Energy per time per area. That's how we characterize what a wave is doing in terms of how much energy it's carrying. Okay? It's better to not just talk about the total energy delivered because as the wave comes at you, it delivers more and more energy over as you let it arrive. So it's, more better, it's better to talk about how much energy arrives per time per area on this wave. So um, what we talked about when light was a wave, that the intensity, the, the brightness, was proportional to the square of the amplitude of the wave. So be careful here. Uh, I know that we have a couple, couple capital E's floating around here. Uh, what I mean here, of course, is the amplitude of the electric field. So, how much is this? So that's not energy there, that is uh, the amplitude of the electric field. So if the wave has a bigger amplitude, it's going to be more bright, essentially. right? And as you send it, say, through a bunch of polarizers, and, and the amplitude will get reduced. And it'll get less bright. That, by the way, was where we got the law of malice. If you remember that, I think you tested it in lab, right? The uh, I out equals I in cosine squared of theta. Well, the cosine came from the fact that you're blocking one component of the electric field and keeping the other that's parallel to the transmission axis, right? So E goes in, E cosine theta comes out, and of course, when we go to intensity, that's a square, proportional to the square of the amplitude, so that, that's why you have your cosine squared in that polarizer equation, right? Does this ring a bell? Okay. So, by the way, no mention whatsoever of uh, the frequency of the light. Um, in this picture, the wave picture, the only thing you have, we should care about is um, what is the amplitude of the electric field, but if the wavelength is shorter or long, the frequency is big or small, you should get the same uh, intensity. Um, this is called the uh, classical picture. And the reason this is called the classical picture is uh, back in the day they didn't know about that light could act as a particle, so um, that's to distinguish it from the uh, quantum picture. When they eventually figure out that light can be thought of as small particles. So, um, what we really kind of do with light is we kind of have our cake and eat it too. Which is to say that sometimes when it's convenient to think of it as a wave, as we've been doing for most of our topics so far, all of our interference stuff, we've been thinking of light as a wave. But sometimes there's certain phenomena where we have to remember that it's these little tiny, little uh, kind of wave, wave like particles. So we really kind of just uh, straddle the fence and sometimes use one for convenience, sometimes use for the other. And so, of course, this bothers people and they, people want to say, well, is light a wave or is it a particle? And the answer is yes. Okay? It's both. No one really has any good way of visualizing this. And it's really kind of weird because sometimes we'll think of it as one way and sometimes we'll think of it as the other way to uh, get the result that um, fits with what we observe in the lab. Okay? So this is kind of, this kind of idea that, that th th these things that we think of as being mutually exclusive is really continuum, that's called wave-particle duality. And anyone that tells you that they really understand what it means to be sort of a wave and sort of a particle you know, that's, 
That's a difficult thing because we have no analogy to that in everyday life. Okay. So what I want to now do is uh, see what can we get um, by thinking about the energy um, in these uh, little particles. So uh, each of these obviously has some has a, is a little packet. So I'm going to actually talk about how much energy is in each of these packets. How much energy does this thing have? So it makes a lot more sense now to talk about the energy of one of these packets. It, it doesn't make any sense to talk about the energy in a whole big light wave that just keeps coming and coming and coming. So that's why we talk about the intensity. But now let's just talk about how much is the energy in one of these packets. And I'm going to uh, just tell you the formula. The energy, and now this is the energy of one photon. It depends on just what is the frequency of the light. So it's the frequency of the light times a constant, which is h. So the frequency of the light will solely determine how much energy is in one of these little packets. So you can see that higher frequency light, the energy of one photon is larger. So we could, for instance, try to draw a, um, so the highest frequency uh, visible light, for instance, is violet, right? I don't have violet, but I have a blue. I might draw it like this. That's like a big wrecking ball. Whereas my red photon, that's the lowest frequency of visible light, so that has the lowest energy. Now, again, this is purely just trying to figure out some way to draw uh, this stuff going on. I don't literally mean they have different sizes. These things don't have any spatial extent to our, our awareness, right? I'm just trying to figure out a way to show that the violet light can be more of a wrecking ball and the red light not so much. Um, and just so you don't think of them as little billiard balls, remember that they're in some sense also waves. So I'm going to draw this little weird picture like that. And because this allows me to also somehow represent the wavelength. So this is the highest frequency, so it's the lowest wavelength. So that would look like that. And then this, of course, was the lowest frequency. All right, I, I'm going to amend this. So highest frequency, lowest wavelength. Let me draw that a little shorter that, and then this is going to look more like that. So again, this is just ridiculous attempts at trying to draw what we're talking about, okay? If you prefer, and again, this has its disadvantages, um, you could draw it like this. So this would be like a, a part thing like this, and this would be more like this. But it's really hard to draw. Okay, there's just no proper way of, of representing wave particle duality. Okay. I like this thing here because it literally reminds me that this thing is going to be like a big wrecking ball. It has a lot of energy, and this is going to be not, right? A low, it's going to be lower energy. So I guess before too long I should tell you the constant. H, this is called Planck's constant. And its only uh, purpose is that it takes the frequency and converts it into energy. So the uh, constant is, uh, in SI units, is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds. So if you uh, um, if you plug it in here, you'll see that works. Frequency is measured in hertz, which is just uh, for inverse seconds, right? Then you multiply that with joules times seconds. The seconds cancel, and of course, you end up with an energy in joules. It's an extremely small number, I should point out, 10 to the minus 34, which means, uh, practically speaking, that for any 
realistic frequency of light, even visible uh, light, which has you know very high frequency, right? Tiny wavelength nanometers, terahertz frequency. Even then, you multiply the terahertz uh, 10 to the 12 by 10 to the minus 34, you're going to get an extremely small amount of energy in any one given photon. So these are tiny little packets of energy. Okay. In fact, the energy scale here is going to be so small that we really don't want to be working in SI units because SI units in some sense is more for everyday amounts. And so let me just propose um, a different unit of energy that's more tailor-made for very, very small amounts. So um, let me go over here, I guess. So this is an um, alternate non-SI unit of energy, which is kind of made for small scale. Whereas the jewel is not really built for that. Um, and in fact, we can use some ideas from earlier on in the class. Um, if you remember our good old formula, PE equals QV. So that was our formula which told us how much potential energy a charge contains when it's in a particular location with a certain voltage, right? This was uh, homework number two. So I'm going to propose that we have uh, one elementary charge in a location where there is one volt. So we're talking about the energy as uh, how much one elementary charge, or I guess in that case it's a proton, right? Um, so how much one pl a plus E charge, how much energy it has by being somewhere where there's one volt? Well, this we call an EV. So this is called, very unfortunately, it's called an electron volt. So I have to tell you what it's called. But it's a little bit of a misnomer because it, seems, it makes it sound like it only applies to electrons. Of course, electrons and protons have an equal amount of elementary charge. They're just one's plus and one's minus, right? So I think it should be called the elementary charge volt, but I guess it doesn't roll off the tongue quite as well. So it's called an electron volt. Or I'll just refer to it as an EV from here on out, so we don't have to really even worry about that. Um, I guess we should take a look here. If we were really trying to do this uh, and figure it out, one volt is one joule per coulomb. And then the elementary charge is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. So the coulombs cancel there. And so the amount of energy here is actually 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. So 1 EV is actually the same amount of energy as 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. And you can see that for small bits of energy, this is going to be much more uh, kind of a easy uh, unit to use. So when we're at the 10 to the minus 19th joule range, we're at in the 1 range on the EV side. So this right here. This is our new unit. If you ever need to do a unit conversion, you can do that. So, um, for instance, over here, I can give you Planck's constant in these alternate, alternate energy units. Uh, I can tell you that Planck's constant will be 4.136 times 10 to the negative 15 EV seconds. Now, that certainly still looks small, but 10 to the minus 15 is not nearly as small as 10 to the minus 34. And so, how would you use it? Well, you can still put in your frequency in uh, hertz or inverse seconds. So that's still SI, but now when you multiply it by something that's in EV seconds, that's going to produce the energy in EV instead. 
And I will point out that while 10 to the minus 15th might still seem small, the frequency of visible light is on the order of terahertz, so when you multiply h times f, you actually get a number that's pretty close to 1. Okay? So let me give you an example. Let's take the visible light range. So we were talking about these uh, quote-unquote uh, um, violet photons and red photons. Let's find out what their range is. So we go Roy G. Bibb. Um, I guess I can um, write down the vacuum wavelengths instead, just because I those are easier to memorize somehow. Um, so that's 700 nanometers, and that's 400 nanometers. So if I write Roy G. Bibb, that's an order of increasing frequency, so that's decreasing wavelength. So if I had those lying around, I might sub out F equals C over lambda. And let me tell you what you get. The energy of one photon, and I'll tell you what they are in EV. Um, this is 1.8 EV, and this is uh, 3.1 EV. So you can see that EV is a pretty good uh, energy unit for using on this scale because um, we're talking that an energy of, photon of, of one photon of visible light is somewhere between 2 to 3 EV, right? So a couple EV. So um, let me uh, um, just say a, a few more words about the EV before I um, move forward. Uh, you may have heard of the Large Hadron Collider, right? It's the biggest particle accelerator that's ever been built by mankind. It's um, basically on the border of Switzerland um, at a place called CERN. And uh, they... Question? Southern Switzerland? Uh, I think it's actually on the border of France, Switzerland, and whatever the third country is. Italy. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive ring that, uh, by design, they put on the borderline between these countries because they want it to be kind of an international effort. And what they do there is they get uh, particles uh, going up to 99.9999% of the speed of light, and then they smash them together. And the whole point of it is if you smash them together, uh, and you look at the pieces that fly out, you can get a sense of what it's made of, right? It's like, the, if you, in the crudest fashion, wanted to know what's inside, underneath the hood of a car, and you couldn't look under the hood, you just smash two cars together and look at the pieces that fly off and kind of work backwards, right? That's what they, they're doing there. So last time I checked, the energies of the Large Hadron Collider were about seven tera electron volts, okay? Now, this is, probably an old figure because they keep on upping the energy. So it sounds like a lot, right? Terra, Terra sounds like, you know, that's, uh, that's 10 to the, what is that, 10 to the 12, right? So that's seven times 10 to the 12 electron volts. And when people see that 10 to the 12, they think, oh my gosh, that sounds like a lot of energy. There was a lawsuit filed against what Large Hadron Collider because people thought that the energies that were being created are so large that they might rip a hole in the fabric of space-time and create a black hole to swallow up the entire Earth and that would be the end of human existence. That was a lawsuit that was filed against the Large Hadron Collider that actually went through the courts. So let's find out how much this really is, okay? So one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Okay, so let's convert that out into everyday units. That will come out to be roughly um, 1.12 microjoules. That is not a lot of energy. In fact, 
Let's find out how much energy that really is on an everyday scale by, say, setting it equal to a good old MGH, right? So that is like gravitational potential energy. Let's say I have a, I don't know, uh, let's say I have a one kilogram mass that I'm lifting up on Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared. In order to get that much gravitational potential energy into one kilogram mass, you'd have to lift it by about 11.4 nanometers, okay? So you have more of a chance of creating a black hole by accidentally dropping something on the floor than they do in the Large Hadron Collider, okay? The amounts of energy that they're working with are minuscule. Don't get me wrong, that's a lot of energy for a very small particle, but on the grand scheme of things, it's actually very small, okay? Did they win the lawsuit just out of curiosity? Uh, of course not. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> So Large Hadron Collider continues increasing their energy. Okay, um, so what I want to now do is I want to go back to um, talking about the uh, energy and let's link this over into intensity because of course this is just the energy in one packet but there's a bunch of these packets that are heading at you in a normal beam of light. So how can we tie this in? to intensity, well remember that intensity, what we said was it's just the energy delivered per time, per area. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bounce this, and I'm going to look at this separately, energy delivered per time. So we have a light beam, how much energy does it deliver per time? Well, um, we can think of it as there's the energy per photon, right? So that's the individual carriers. So how much energy is carried in each photon? And then we have to multiply that by, of course, how many photons we get per time. So the photon is just kind of the middleman. That's how the energy is actually carried. Each photon has a certain amount of energy. And then the second question is, of course, do we get a lot of photons or a few photons, right? So the photon here cancel, and we just get, of course, energy per time. The photon is just the middleman. So it's like asking how much mail is delivered per year in the United States, right? Well, one way to figure out how much mail is carried per year is to ask how much mail does each mail carrier carry and how many mail carriers deliver every day, right? So the photon is just the middleman here for how the energy gets delivered. It's delivering these little uh, incremental packets. Well, let's figure it out. The energy per photon we just talked about, H times F, and then the, the, the photons per time, that's just the rate at which they arrive, which I'll call capital R. That's just the rate of photon delivery. And I guess the energy per time, maybe I should call it by its correct name, energy per time is, of course, power. So, this actually tells us that there are, there's more than one way to deliver a certain amount of energy per time. We have flexibility now in doing it with the number of photons and how much energy each of those photons has. So for instance, if we want to say have a fixed amount of power delivered, what we could do is do it with a lot of low energy photons or very few high energy photons, right? So we could have a, a high frequency, low rate del of delivery. I guess that would be our, uh, our, uh, our violet photons here. So we have a few of those. That's one way to deliver the uh, amount of power. Or the other option would be, of course, uh, if we have a low frequency light, which each of the photons has a small amount of energy, but we just have a lot of them. That would look kind of like this. So it sounds a lot like what the transformer does with the power. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You can choose how the energy is carried. But I should point out that uh, 
this was not really an option when we were talking about light as a wave, right? So we didn't, there was no, nothing we could uh, choose to vary, right? So it's the fact that the photons are quantized, which allows us to choose, do we have these packets, fewer of them with more energy or, uh, or more of the, these with less energy. So the, the, the particle picture of light is what allows us to go to that kind of idea where we can carry the energy in different ways, right? We wouldn't have had that flexibility if we just had light as a wave, right? Because there the only thing you can do is vary the amplitude, right? You have no flexibility otherwise how that energy is carried. Does that make sense? So this is how frequency sneaks in. Remember, frequency had nothing to do with anything, but now we have frequency that sneaks in. And the way, of course, it sneaks in is that the frequency tells you about the energy of one packet. And if you don't have packets, then you, you don't, uh, the frequency doesn't matter, right? So here, the only option we had was to vary the, the uh, amplitude of the wave, but if we change the frequency, it shouldn't affect anything. And uh, so we have a, a, a seemingly, now a, a difference in what the two part pictures say, right? The two pictures, one say frequency shouldn't matter and the other one says it should. And so, of course, um, this is just jumping ahead a little bit to what I'll talk, be talking about a little later today, but if you go and you design an experiment to really kind of drive a wedge here and say, does frequency matter or doesn't it, of course, what you end up finding is that it does matter, okay? So that's what, how they figured out that light does behave as a particle. Um, so that, that's something I'll talk about momentarily here called the photoelectric effect, it was what Einstein won his Nobel Prize for. Okay. Um, so I guess the final piece that I should mention, um, of course, this is just the power, but uh, there's of course the area as well, right? So uh, the only other thing that matters is um, over what area are these things spread? So if you increase the area, that's going to bring down the intensity. So to give you an example, Let's say I have some kind of light bulb or light source. And let me suppose that I put some kind of filter on it. Maybe let's say put a red filter on it. So that only uh, red photons are coming out. So I want to point out that by definition, when you're close by, the uh, photons that are emerging are, of course, uh, concentrated over a relatively small area. But when you go over here, those same photons are much more spread out. So it's the same power, right? These, those photons collectively carry that energy outward. They have that energy closer in. They have that energy over here. That's dip, no different. But the difference is that that energy that they're all collectively carrying is spread out over, uh, did I duplicate any? This one, this one, this one. Whoops, I started to get a little squirrely here. I should have probably just gone like this. It just go out. I want to make sure every photon there is accounted for. So the energy contained in all those photons is exactly the same. But it's just that here, they're spread out over a larger area, so uh, the intensity is lower. That's just a kind of a natural property of light, and in fact, all waves. Um, this idea that when waves start to travel out from somewhere, the energy starts to get spread more thin. That's why light looks dimmer from further away, and why sound is quieter from further away, right? It's just the spreading out of the energy. So if you're, for instance, here, observing this light, you're not going to get nearly as much of that energy because the rest of it already went somewhere else, right? Um, so um, that's the final ingredient. And uh, so let's say I'm this observer. I'm, of course, going to be... Um, 
at a particular location where the light has spread out over a certain area and the intensity uh, is going to be less the further away that that is. But there are, if intensity is quote unquote brightness, we have to expand our definition a little bit about what brightness means. Okay. So we don't normally think of, of course, as like when light gets more bright, um, it it doesn't change color, but it's just more um, like kind of blinding, right? That would be more like, um, so I guess I'll call that like traditional brightness. What we would do is we have a fixed frequency and we increase the rate that will make it more intense. So for instance, if you have a dimmer on a light switch or something like that, when you increase the, the you turn up the dimmer, you make it more bright, what you're actually doing is you're taking more photons, which have the same frequency, but you're, or, or you have the photons frequencies and changing, but you're just getting more of them, right? You're getting an increased rate of photon delivery. And when you turn the dimmer down, you're getting less photons. One of the problems on your homework, I'm actually going to ask you, um, how many photons is actually enough to be able to see uh, anything based on um, or differentiated from darkness. So obviously, at some point, you start to see that you can't see at all, right? Pitch black. The question is, what rate of photon delivery is high enough so that you can tell that there's light? Now, you might think these photons are incredibly small, right? So they're tiniest little packets. You might think it may take millions or billions of these before you can tell. But our eye, of course, has had uh, millions of years of evolution. It can actually work with uh, on the order of like a thousand photons, and it can already tell that that is not darkness, okay? So I actually have you compute the exact number. It does depend on the frequency of light as well, of course, F is in the equation. So that's, of course, what we call traditional brightness, but there is an al also another way to increase the intensity. The other way to increase density is to leave the uh, rate of delivery fixed, but increase the frequency. So you can take exactly the same number of photons, but you just change those photons from ones that have less energy to ones that have more energy. Now, we wouldn't normally call that a brightness change, we'd call that a color change, right? But technically speaking, if you, say, had this light bulb, and you took off your red filter and you put on a violet filter, that is also an increase in intensity, and that is more energy delivered per time per area, right? Because you're switching out the less energetic photons with the more energetic photons when you go to higher frequency. You're switching from the red to the violet. So not what we would, of course, traditionally associate as brightness, but it is delivering more energy per time. So um, for instance, if you go to, um, well, this is getting to be such an antiquated example. They used to have these things called dark rooms where you developed film for these things called cameras that weren't digital, okay? So if you've ever been in a dark room, anybody ever been in a dark room? Wow, okay, cool, okay. So what kind of light did they use when you want to see what you're doing? Red light. Red light, okay. Why do they use red light? Um, because red light, the photons have the lowest energy and so the hope is that they're gonna muck up at the least, what you're doing. You need to see something, you can't just kind of uh, stumble around the dark, but you want to use the type of photons that have the least energy contained in them. So the hope is, is that they will not uh, mess up your, what you're, uh, you're developing uh, too early, right? Um, okay, so that's a little bit about photons. Um, and again, the frequency enters in because it frequency informs the energy of each of these carriers. So what we're going to do now is use these ideas to discuss two phenomena where the particle picture of light, photon picture, is indispensable. You can't explain what's going on any other way. So the first of which is the photoelectric effect, which I already mentioned. And then the second system we'll take a look at uh, is something called the Bohr model. Um, it is a model for the 
uh, hydrogen atom and hydrogen-like atoms, and I'll tell you what that means. Um, this is where we really start to really dovetail into whatever chemistry classes you have to take where you talk about uh, spectra. You guys do spectroscopy. If you haven't, you will. That's something that's important for chemistry. So we'll basically um, kind of come up to that uh, and, uh, and see where all that stuff comes from. So, the photoelectric effect. So, um, the name, it's all in the name there, what it suggests, photo, meaning light, and electric, meaning electric. Okay, so this is some phenomenon that actually uh, combines light with electricity. So let me uh, uh, draw this system. We get a very familiar looking thing. We have a, a capacitor that we're charging with a battery. So what's going to happen here? Looks like this. And we, of course, know when the uh, Q goes to Q full on the capacitor, the current goes to zero. And I put an ammeter there uh, in just to indicate that we are measuring the current. So this is all hopefully old news from homework number four. So now we're going to introduce completely out of left field an element that we did not consider previously. What we can do is we can actually shine light on to one of these plates. And we find something interesting is that if the properties of that light are just right, suddenly we get current again. So what's happened? Well, what's happened is that the light that's coming in has energy. That energy, if it's enough, will actually get a, a pop off one of these electrons so one of these electrons, or, or some of these electrons, will actually get liberated and can jump off the material completely because they have enough energy to do so. When they pop off here, they're called a photoelectron, which I always think is a bit of a funny name because it makes it sound like they're not just a regular old uh, garden variety electron. That's what they are. It's not some kind of weird photon electron mutant hybrid or something like that. It's just a name we give to a one of these electrons that happens to have gotten popped off the material versus all the electrons that didn't weren't so lucky. Okay? So that's all a photoelectron is. It's an electron that has gotten liberated off of the plate because it's gotten uh, uh, the energy from the light. And so once it's over here, it's obviously not going to want to come back to this negative plate, because why would it? It doesn't like other negative charges. Now it has a chance to be free. Where is it going? Where do you think, what becomes of it? It, it probably wants to go to these positive charges. So it just goes over there. And if that's the case, we now have one electron not here, canceling off one of these, and what happens? <clears throat> what happens now? It wants to reload. That's exactly right. So now that the capacitor isn't full anymore, and we do see that there is a uptick, a very small one, a very small uptick in current while the thing is refilling again. So the uptick, uh, so what happens is that if you shine light, on the capacitor plate that is of, has the right properties, then you will notice that the current is not zero while the cap refills. That's, of course, how you know what happened. You know that uh, if suddenly you see a non-zero current when you shine light on one of the plates, you know that that light had to somehow impart energy onto the electrons. 
So that's what the photoelectric effect is. Okay? So this was noticed experimentally in the lab. And then people started saying, OK, how can we explain this? What are the particulars? And this is one of those experiments where if you work out what should happen with the classical wave picture and what should happen with the photon picture, you actually will get drastically different results. So only one of them is, of course, borne out by experimental data. So then they can say, oh, OK, well, I guess quantum physics is real. So let's go through those details. Um, so for the classical model, so that's the wave picture, and then for the quantum picture, um, that's the photon. So what do they each have to say about this? So the first thing we should address is what is the energy needed to uh, achieve, or I should say get, photoelectrons in the first place. Oops, I accidentally, that's supposed to be like this. Hopefully I still have enough space. So what is it that we have to do in order to achieve this? Well, in the wave picture, um, the energy just kind of continuously keeps coming, right? There's no granularity to it whatsoever. In the classical, uh, you just basically have a wave that's imparting more and more and more energy. And so what you expect there is that if you're wave does not carry that much energy to begin with because it's of a low intensity. If you have a low intensity, which means it doesn't have that much energy, we're going to have to wait. Because we, of course, need enough energy buildup in order to pop uh, one of these electrons off. Okay. So we're basically just saying that the light that comes in is a wave. It's a very small trickle. It's low intensity, so it's a low trickle of energy. And it's going to have to wait. It's kind of like when you're a kid and you, know, you get a dollar once in a while here and there, and you're going to save up to buy your favorite toy. right? It's going to take you a while to save up, but eventually you'll get it. right? So that's kind of the wave picture. Um, so let's now contrast that with the uh, quantum picture. What we have in the quantum picture, and I guess let me draw kind of a, a little bit of a picture here. I guess I could, while I'm at it, I can draw the wave picture in there as well. So in the wave picture, we can imagine that the light is in, 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 is uh, on. Uh, is sending its energy to one of those things and eventually it can save up enough to pop off, right? So that's the wave picture. Now let's talk about it in terms of particles. So these are the photons. So this is what Einstein came up with. He basically just said, an electron has one chance and one chance only. If one of the photons gets absorbed by one of the electrons, so the energy of one photon to one electron, That's his one chance to get out. Okay. If that energy of that photon is enough, it will pop off. But you cannot wait around for to get another photon. You can't save up. Okay. So here you can save up 
But here, you have one shot, one chance. Because what happens is, if you absorb one of these packets, and that's not enough to free you, by the time another packet might come around, which might be a while, you'll have lost that energy to everybody else. Okay? So I guess the example would be, um, trying to think of an example. Uh, so the idea is, is that you have a bunch of people in, the, in a room, and it costs, I don't know, $10 to leave the room. So if you want to leave the room, someone can come in, give you $10, you say, okay, I'm leaving. But if you come in and you give them $9, then by the time someone else, someone might give you, uh, give you more money that's enough to leave, you've lost that $9 because there's a bunch of other people in the room that also want that money and they're not going to let you just keep it and save it, okay? So you have one shot to get out. If the photon has enough energy to pop you off, great. If not, then you don't leave, okay? So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between photon, one photon being absorbed by one electron if that photon has enough energy to get to leave, great. If not, then you don't. And you don't have it, you can't save it up for later. Sounds like paying cash at the toll bridges. Oh, there you go, right? You're, uh, they, they're not going to, well, they'll let you through, but you get charged like 40, 50 bucks, right? But let's say that they just made you wait there forever, right? Or you couldn't get through if you don't have the, the money at all, the, all the money, right? So obviously this does depend on the, 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 the light arriving in these packets and then one of these little bundles, of, uh, does it have enough energy to free you or it doesn't? It's not like a continuous stream of energy that you can just store up, okay? So for the, in the quantum picture, the energy you needed to get photoelectrons, there has to be enough energy in one photon to uh, allow one electron to escape. So let's work out the details of that. So, um, it's a, quite a simple equation. It basically says this, um, that the energy of the photoelectron, so that's upon ejection, upon flying away, will be the energy that it got from the photon minus this quantity, which is basically your, your toll, right? It's how much it costs to leave. So that's the energy in one escaped electron. This is the energy it got from a photon. And this is the energy cost to leave. This is your toll, so to speak. And of course, you. Um, there will be, have to be some energy cost. If there was no energy cost, then none of the electrons would stay hanging out with each other, right? Otherwise, the material would just leak out electrons. This metal plate would just leak out electrons spontaneously, right? Why would they all stay hanging out with each other? Well, it must be because there's some energy cost associated with leaving the material, and they don't have it. So this is how we liberate a photon, is that it has enough to pay the toll. So for instance, oh, and I guess I should tell you the name of this, this is called the work function. So work function. And it's a property of the material. Is that, is that the whole thing or just the? Oh, just the, the fee. Okay. So for instance, in my example earlier, I said that the cost to leave is 10 bucks. So it's cost to leave room is 10 bucks, right? So, which means that if you don't have 10 bucks, you're not leaving, but if someone swoops in and they give you $11, 
you can leave. You pay your 10 bucks to leave and you have $1 in your pocket as you walk away, right? So if someone comes in and gives you $11, then you have $1 left over. So that's all that equation is saying, okay, is that uh, photon comes in and gives you energy. First you have to pay the cost to leave the material and then anything that you have left over you get to keep, right? And the way that you keep it is kinetic energy, right? So you just are flying through space, um, that electron's flying through space with some velocity. So that's our equation. Um, and let me go ahead and put in kinetic energy equals, and then the energy of one photon is HF. So this is really our main equation. So notice here that frequency is big, really important because if you only have one shot to leave, you better make that photon a good one, right? So if the frequency is too low, every single one of those photons will not have enough energy to let you leave, okay? So that means that the energy in one photon is less than the work function. So nobody escapes. So that's how frequency enters into it. It's like if you're sending in a bunch of red photons, those red photons all have very little energy, so it doesn't matter how many of them you send in, because they're all, they all suck, right? You're sending in a bunch of things that don't have enough energy to get any electrons out of there. And I should mention that if you increase the intensity by increasing the rate of delivery, you're just sending in more things that suck, okay? It doesn't matter. If, if one photon, red photon, can't get anything to escape, then a million red photons can't get anything to escape, right? So if the frequency is too low, you can increase the intensity, which will just increase the rate of delivery, but you still get nothing. Does that make sense? You're trying to tune and make sure that that one single packet of that one bundle of energy that's your chance to get free, you're trying to make sure that that has enough energy. And if it doesn't, one of them doesn't, then a bunch of them will, won't help, okay? So uh, over here, um, when we say enough energy in one photon to allow one electron to escape, we're talking about the frequency has to be high enough. The frequency of the light has to be high enough. If the frequency is too low, increasing the rate of the delivery won't help. So maybe instead of just making the red light that you're shining on this thing brighter, sending more red light, maybe you should switch from red to violet light, right? So that you get these big, more wrecking balls that have a larger energy, okay? And I should tell you, by the way, that the work functions, generally visible light is not good enough for most materials. For most materials, you have to start getting into the UV. So when you start shining UV light on things, that's when they really start to take electrons off. It. So well, an example would be if you've ever left anything out in the, like a piece of fabric or something out in the um, sunlight for too long, it starts to get, look really faded. That's because the UV light is coming in and basically uh, taking electrons and knocking them off that material so it's basically slowly disintegrating to the UV light. If you leave a, that same piece of fabric indoors, it looks fine years later usually, right? Maybe some wear and tear, but 
usually visible light is not enough to uh, initiate this. You have to have special materials that um, visible light's high enough energy. One application of this, by the way, is in elevators. So if you've ever been running to catch an elevator and you stick your hand in there and the door um, opens, so that basically that sensor works on a photoelectric uh, sensor. So this idea is that there's a beam of light that is shining from one side of the doorway to the other, and normally that is enough to excite electrons and it allows electrical circuit to flow. And if you put your hand in there and you block that light, well, what that means is that it cuts off the electrical flow and it tells the circuit, hey, there's someone who has an arm or a leg in there. Okay. So, um, I guess, you know, I got a little overexcited there with the uh, applications, but if I compare this against the, this thing, frequency shouldn't have anything to do with it, right? So, in the, the wave picture, frequency has nothing to do with this. So, there, if my intensity is low enough, I should just have to wait longer for photoelectrons, but I should get some, right? Because you're allowed to save up. Where frequency enters into it, so frequency has nothing to do with this, but frequency enters into it here because that informs the energy of one photon, right? So the frequency tells you how much or how little energy one photon has, and if that's not enough, there's nothing you can do about it. You're not going to get anything. So, of course, you can go into a lab and figure out which of these two things happens. When you shine light on this apparatus, you have to just wait and get photoelectrons, or if the frequency is too low, you get nothing no matter how intense you make the light, right? If, you, uh, if the frequency is low and you, uh, you increase the rate, you'll increase the intensity, but nothing will happen. So, of course, this is what really happens. In a lab, this is what you find. And until Einstein came along, no one could figure out why. So he basically just posited the simple idea that there's a one to one pairing between photons of light and electrons. He wasn't the first person, by the way, to come up with quantum physics. Uh, the constant H, which is called Planck's constant, um, was come up with came up with by Planck, who was the first person to think of this. He kind of came up with it as a mathematical trick. He didn't even really believe it. He's like, I don't know why this works, but it does. So Einstein was the first person to say, no, 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 this quantum physics stuff is real. So, um, and he applied it to this problem. Um, ironically, later in life, he started to really take issue with some of the further developments in the thing that he helped get started. So he, was not a believer in some of the completely correct science that came after the fact. So even as smart as he was, there was things that he just, uh, science kind of um, evolved past him at some point. Um, I should mention also, he won the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect because he also happened to come up with relativity in the same year. He was a 21-year-old uh, patent clerk just working behind the desk desk job, didn't have any professor position yet. Um, he came up with all that stuff and many more in like a single year. And relativity, which was so revolutionary at the time, it was considered a little iffy or controversial. So they kind of chickened out and instead of giving him the Nobel Prize for that, he gave him it for this. Okay. Um, so uh, let's get back to the details here. Um, so. The, uh, we can actually solve here for what it will be the minimum frequency. Well, the minimum frequency, which I'll call F naught, that's called the cutoff frequency. Um, well, that is, of course, the frequency that exactly pays the toll with no parting gift, right? So you don't have, the uh, photoelectron doesn't have any parting gift of extra energy to, to keep. Basically the photon paid exactly the work function and then we, has nothing left over. So if you solve here, the cutoff frequency 
will be the work function of the material divided by Planck's constant. So basically you can see that if the work function of the material is higher, some materials just have a lower cost to get out, some have a higher cost to get out, and the higher cost it is to get out, the higher frequency you're going to have to clear before you get anything. Um, we could even make a graph we can make a graph of the frequency of light that we shine on the material and the kinetic energy of the photoelectrons that we see escaping so the cutoff frequency you won't even get anything until you hit that and then of course if you want to send in more energetic photons well then, you can, and then you will have a party gift. So it kind of looks like this. So any frequency that clears that, you, the, more, the more the frequency is higher, the more the energy has fot uh, photon has energy, and that means once you've paid off the work function, you'll get more and more kinetic energy to keep. This equation right here, can actually when we model, this is my y-axis, and so this is my x-axis. So uh, what's the slope of my graph? It's constant. Constant, and what, what constant? Planck's constant. Yep. And then the y-intercept is what? So the minus the work function, right? So that basically kind of shows you how big of a hole do you have to climb out of before you get some of these photoelectrons, right? So this might be the work function of one material. Maybe another material has an even deeper hole, right? The work function is large, and so the hole that you have to climb out of is deeper. So what that will mean is that its cutoff frequency is higher, right? You have to go to a higher frequency before you get anything. And then, of course, anything above that, there's your parting gift of kinetic energy, but I should point out that the slope is exactly the same, right? Because the slope is a fundamental constant. That's how they find this constant, by the way. For all materials, the slope is the same between looking at the kinetic energy of the ejected electron versus the frequency of incoming light. The y-intercept may change because different materials have different holes that you need to climb out of to get anything. They have different costs for leaving, but all of them have the same slope. It's this fundamental constant. So I guess just to finish up this second row, um, the first thing is the energy needed to get photoelectrons. So in reality, we have to make sure the frequency exceeds the cutoff frequency to get anything. If the frequency is below the cutoff frequency, then increasing the intensity won't help. Yes, you're sending in more energy, you're sending in more energy by sending in more photons, none of which can do anything. So the next thing we want to talk about is that if, the frequ if you do get photoelectrons, what happens? So if you get photoelectrons, um, what are they like? So here's what you find, and I guess at this point, um, we already know that the classical picture is wrong, so I don't want to belabor that too much, um, but I guess the classical theory would predict that if, the, uh, if you increase the intensity, um, you will have to wait less, right? And it's unclear. Uh, in what form those photoelectrons would they take. So we could have, if we focus the light beam really carefully on something, we could get a, um, a maybe one electron gets it all, so we could have a um, more energetic photoelectron, or we could get more photoelectrons each with less energy.
So there's no really uh, constraints on how that energy, energy is distributed. It's just whether or not your wave will, how it will distribute that energy. So um, does that energy get distributed among, among a smaller, bigger group of electrons, or are you focusing down on one electron? Well, here, it's really unclear which one you get, whereas there are strict uh, conditions placed on what happens in the quantum picture. So in the quantum picture, we already know that we have to exceed the cutoff frequency to get anything, so that's what we're talking about now. And now we have two options. Remember that um, we could increase the frequency while leaving the rate of delivery constant. So we're increasing the frequency further. Or we can leave the frequency fixed and increase the rate. So remember we're talking about all the frequencies as being high enough above the cutoff frequency, but now we're talking about increasing the intensity further. Well, here, this means that each photon has more energy, and this means we have a fixed number of them, so what this is going to mean is that we get, um, I guess let me put it like this, we get the same number of photoelectrons, so I guess I'll put photoelectrons here, photoelectrons, so these are the photons that we're sending in on this column, and then the photoelectrons, we get the same number of them, but each with more energy. Okay. Since R is fixed, that fixes the number we get, but since we increase the frequency, that's more uh, energetic photons, and of course the photoelectrons that take those energies will also be more energetic. And that's in contrast that if our, we fix our frequency, we're going to have each has the same energy, but we just get more of them. Okay. So we have the ability to precisely control this. If we increase the rate, we send in more photons, we'll get more photoelectrons. But if we're fixing the energy of each of those photons, we're fixing the energy given to those photoelectrons. Okay, so obviously, these are very stringent conditions. We can check it in a lab, and we can find that everything proceeds just like the quantum picture predicts. We need to clear a certain frequency to get anything, and then once we clear that frequency, we have control over increasing the number of photoelectrons released or the energy that they each have. That is all control that comes from the frequency uh, that is contained in the, the photon energy. And so this is the correct picture. Okay, so let's call that a day. Um, that's the end of photoelectric effect, and I'll start the... Uh,